Okay, hello and welcome everyone to this lesson on what a Norman village looks like. So obviously villages had existed long before the Norman Conquest, long before William the Conqueror came over and defeated Harold Godwinson. We are looking in today's lesson at what villages looked like after the Norman Conquest, so after they came over uh, and made their changes. Although we will see in the course of the lesson that there were many continuities as well. So there are a lot of things that stayed the same from the Anglo-Saxon period before well into the Norman period. So what are the destination questions for today's lesson? Number one, we're going to try and answer the question, what were the basic features of the Norman village? So what kind of buildings were present? How were they laid out? How were they organised? Secondly, we're going to look at this question of who had power in the Norman villages. So we'll look at the social hierarchy. Hierarchy, hierarchy is a nice keyword that you can use to talk about the kind of power relationships that were present in the Norman villages and in wider society. This lesson is going to be particularly useful for you if you are an AQA GCSE history student and you're studying the Norman England unit. However, it could be just as useful if you're an Edexcel student looking at Norman England or if you're in Key Stage 3 and looking at the Norman Conquest. The information is going to be relevant to all those groups, but it is geared particularly to the AQA specifications. So if you're taking that GCSE, this lesson is going to be really handy for you. So we're going to start by getting some key words down. So get your pen, get your paper, uh, maybe pause the video here and copy the definitions. And then I'm going to talk through each one so that we're nice and clear on what each of those words means. So we're starting with the word manor and manor is the word given to the area of land that covers a village or in some cases several villages and the manor is owned by the local lord. Then we've got the manor house. Now that is the lord's house within the village and as we'll see later on the lord's house is kind of very fancy. It's uh, certainly the most sophisticated building within the confines of the village, the most comfortable to live in. Now, I think it's interesting to note with Manor and Manor House that at least in London, and I may be showing my age here and showing how out of touch I am, but there is uh, quite a common use of the word Manor in London slang. And that is to basically mean a kind of area or territory that uh, you control. So in a sense, there's an unbroken line from the Norman use of this word, manor and manor house, to modern slang. They're both used to mean power over a territory. I think that's quite interesting. Then we've got serf. We can say villain or peasant in place of serf, uh, although there are some subtle differences between these that we'll explore in future lessons. Um, I haven't put a definition here because it's likely you'll already know. In case you don't, a serf is the person at the bottom of the feudal system, so the very bottom of the hierarchy in the Normans' social system, and they spent most of their lives uh, farming and working for the local lord. Next, we've got freemen. Now, freemen are a particular type of peasant, and they're sort of like a higher class of peasant. They're a little bit further up the social hierarchy. So a free man is a peasant who only has to do work for the Lord occasionally. They have to do what's called boon work, which is during a harvest or on another particular special occasion when a Lord requires it, the free man will have to work for that Lord. For the rest of the time, they are free to farm for themselves. So they've got a little bit more freedom than the villains and the regular peasants who are even lower down. Next, we've got a word that looks like it should be said demesne, uh, but is actually pronounced domain. And this means land that is held directly by the local lord. So this is where, as you might have already guessed, we get our modern word domain, uh, which just means an area that you control. Next, we've got reeve, and that is the lord's manager on the land. So the reeve is someone that is chosen out of the peasants who live in the village to sort of control all the other peasants and manage them and basically keep them in line. Uh, they're there as a kind of manager for the local lord. And reeve is where we get the modern word sheriff, which comes from shire and reeve put together, shire being a large area of land and reeve being the lord's manager on the land. 
Then finally, we've got another word that is still in use today, which is bailiff. Uh, and a bailiff was a local law enforcer acting on behalf of the crown and making sure that taxes and debts were repaid and that laws were enforced. OK, so let's start then with an overview of the features of the Norman village. First things first, 90% of people lived in the countryside villages. This is one of those things where you have to really stop and appreciate all the differences between Norman England and modern day England. Nowadays, we think of people as living in towns and cities almost naturally. It's just our kind of natural assumption. But back then in the Norman times, the vast majority of people would live in the countryside villages overwhelmingly this was the pattern of life for people. There would be around a few hundred per village approximately. And really that was towards the sort of larger end of the Norman villages. There could even be uh, villages with a smaller number, sometimes as few as 100 people in one of these villages. The villages were controlled by the Lord of the manor and the Lord lived in the manor house as we've discussed. According to the Doomsday Book, in 1086, there were about 13,400 villages. So there's quite a lot. This was, as we've said, a really dominant mode of life for peasants in the Norman era. However, spoiler alert, nothing really changed for the lives of peasants relative to the Anglo-Saxon period that had come before. Now, I'm being a little bit facetious. Some things did change, but for most peasants in the villages, life was essentially pretty similar under the Norman lords as it had been under the Anglo-Saxon earls. The relationship was very, very similar, one of mastery compared to daily work in the farms from the serfs. They tended to live in cottages and grew their crops on strips of land. So they would have their land not all in one big block, but on a sort of narrow strip. They also had an area of common land where all their farm animals were allowed to graze together. So all of the serfs in the villages would be given one spot where they were allowed to have their animals come and eat. They used to use ox driven plows. Now that was the reason for farming the land in strips. It might seem a bit odd to farm the land uh, in a strip formation. You might not think why not just have a, a huge chunk of it all together, but they needed to do it in strips so that the ox could easily pull the plow in a straight line. They're reliant on that kind of technology for their farming. And that was the reason for farming the land in strips. In terms of what kind of crops they were trying to farm for, it was typically things like wheat, barley and rye. The houses were built along the roads and they tended to cluster them together. And the villages were often built near woodland and then organised around that common land that we spoke about before, where the animals were all allowed to graze together. So let's pause here and do a little knowledge check. I'm going to pop some questions up on the screen. You're going to write down your answers with your pen and paper. Try and use full sentences if you can, and then we'll check the answers in a second. So question one, did life change a lot, somewhat, or not much for peasants in the villages following the Norman conquest? Question two, how was farmland shaped in the villages and why was it shaped like this? Question three, where did the peasants' animals graze? And question four, what kind of crops did the peasants farm for? So just pause the video here, take your time, write down some full sentence answers to this. If there's one that you don't know or you're not sure of, think for a moment. And then if you're really not sure, don't worry, leave it there. And we'll check the answers in a second. See if you can shoot for four out of four. Okay, let's check the answers. So question one, life changed very little for the majority of peasants. The patterns of work, the strip farming and so on, is actually pretty similar from the Anglo-Saxon period to the Norman period. Of course, they've got a new nationality of lords that's got power over them. It's now the French and not the old Anglo-Saxons, not the old English. Uh, but the relationship is broadly pretty similar. The farmland was arranged into strips. And the reason for that was the ease of the ox driven plows. It was much easier to get the ox to go in a straight line 
uh, rather than to get it to adopt any kind of other movement pattern. And so the farmland therefore was arranged into strips for the ease of those ploughs. Question three, the villages were often organised around the common land and the common land was where the animals all grazed together. And then question four, the kind of crops that they were likely to be growing and harvesting were wheat, oats, barley and rye. Now, a quick challenge for you. If we think about the buildings that were likely to be in a Norman village, and I've put a little, um, a little drawing up there on the slide to give you some ideas, which building do you think was the most important in the Norman village? What possibilities are coming to mind? Perhaps you're thinking of the mill. You could be thinking of the houses. You might think of the manor house. You might think of the church. Which building was most important? Bullet point down your idea now. OK, here we go. So the church was arguably the most important building in the village. You could make a very strong case as well that it was the manor house, since the manor house housed the single most powerful individual in the village, the local lord. But I would say that the church trumps even that. And I'm going to explain why now. So it was by far the most important building in the Norman village, and they tend to be made out of stone. What you've got to remember is Christianity at this time was an overwhelmingly important feature of life. So Roman Catholicism, the religion of the Pope in Rome, was absolutely dominant. Remember, when William invaded and carried out the Battle of Hastings, one of the factors in his victory was having the papal banner. So a banner from the Pope saying that God was on his side. And that tended to mean that people flocked to William's army to support him. Probably without the Pope's backing, things would have gone very, very differently. So the role of religion, uh, both in wider society, things like the Norman Conquest as a whole, but also in terms of people's daily lives, was just so, so important. It's still an important factor in today's world, but in today's world, it's much, much less than it was uh, in the Norman times. In the Norman times, there was no one really that would buck the trend of being a Catholic. Certainly in public, you would, uh, you would always say that you followed this religion. Another reason it was important was the church's bell tower was how villagers knew when to start and finish their work. So it even organised the non-religious aspects of life in the village. It would tell the villagers when to get up and start working and it would announce when it was time for them to finish. So not only religious, but also the wider life of the village, the church was important for. They also spent most of their free time in the church. So the peasants, although they spent a hell of a lot, a hell of, a lot of their time working, a lot of their free time would end up being in the church for a variety of reasons. To start with, obviously on a Sunday, that was where the church services were every week and everyone was expected to attend. But they would also run services on feast days and on holy days, so the days of uh, particular given saints, for example. And that's actually where we get our modern word holiday. It's uh, just a change in pronunciation of the word holy day. Uh, and that came from the fact that people weren't expected to work on those holy days and they would go to church instead. So we now use holiday to indicate a day where we don't have to work. The church was also the sturdiest building in each Norman village. And the reason for that is the church kind of doubled up and had a number of other functions at all times during the village. So sometimes the church would be used as a store of goods, for example, the produce from the farms or farming equipment. Sometimes it could be used as a prison and sometimes it would even be used as a fortress in times of danger. So if the village was under threat, it could be a place where people would uh, gather for safety and on account of its sturdiness as a structure, it would be less vulnerable to attack than other buildings in the Norman village. So a challenge for you now. Why was the church such an important building in the Norman village? Just pause here, see if you can remember all the things I just said about why the churches were so important. You could do it as a spider diagram, you could do it as bullet points, or if you prefer, you could write this out as a full paragraph. What made it so important? 
just pause the video here, give yourself a chance to get these answers down. And then we will double check and see what the answer should be. Okay, here is the challenge answer. So number one, most free time was spent there. So obviously Sundays when they didn't have to work, but also feast days and holy days. Religion was overwhelmingly central to life at this time. Everyone was a Catholic Christian, at least outwardly, and it played a huge, huge role in public life. The church bell signaled the start and the end of work, so it organised even the basic working day. It had non-religious, secular functions as well. Services were on holy days and feast days as well as Sundays, as we mentioned. So the religious aspect to the church wasn't just that once a week on a Sunday. It was also dotted throughout the year in the form of the feast days and the holy days. And then finally, the church had extra functions. It had non-religious functions entirely, like doubling up as a prison, a store for goods or a fortress in times of attack and danger. OK, so we've now hit our first objective of the lesson, which is describing the basic features of life in the villages, what kind of buildings were present and how life was organised there. Now we're moving on to social roles in the Norman village. And this is really our second destination question referring to who had power in these villages. So peasants made up the vast majority of the population in the villages. If you lived in a village, chances were you were a peasant. The local lord of the manor would keep 25 to 35 percent of the village's land for personal use. Now, don't get this mixed up with ownership. The lord of the manor essentially owns all of the land in that manor as his personal domain, that word that looks like domesny. However, 25 to 35% of that is not only owned by him, it's kept from everybody else and is just for his personal use. So that's that 25 to 35%. It doesn't mean that 65 to 75% of the land is not owned by the manor, uh, by the Lord, sorry. It's all owned by the Lord, but 25 to 35%, no one has, nobody else has access to that bit of land and it is all for personal use. Of the rest of it, it's divided up into those strips for the peasants so that they can use the ox driven plows. But even then, they've still got to pay rent to the Norman Lord. So it's not as though they're being gifted this land just for their own uh, betterment they still have to pay rent to the local lord for even those strips of land. So the lord has got all the power. It's a real tight, strong central hierarchy in these Norman villages. The manor itself is the specific area in the village that includes the manor house, the barns, villagers' houses, mills and roads. Those who worked in the manor were generally known as freemen. So just a reminder, if we go back to our keywords, the free men were the peasants who only had to work for the Lord during harvest and sowing time, uh, and that was called boon work. The rest of the time, they were free to farm for themselves. So they were sort of a higher class of peasant farmer. They had a little bit more freedom than the villains down at the bottom. The rest, as we've said, was divided up into strips for the peasants, but they've still got to pay that rent. And then the collective name for all of that land owned by the Lord was a domain and as we mentioned earlier in the keywords this is where we get our modern word domain which really just means the same thing an area that is uh, under control now thinking about the manor houses so the manor house in the village that was where the local lord would live and as you might guess the manor houses tended to be more secure and warm than the peasants houses and that was because they were made from stone uh, and so they just were much more secure and warm. The peasants' houses, on the other hand, were really cold. But not only were they cold, they're also vulnerable to being set on fire because of their thatched roofs. So the uh, roofs of their houses were made from straw, from thatch, and therefore they could catch fire very easily, unlike the stone of the Lord's Manor House. And the peasants' houses tend to, tended to consist of just one single room. You could often get a situation where they were even colder and darker inside the house than it was uh, outside. So they were pretty grim places, the houses of the peasants. And to cap all that off, the peasants weren't even allowed to leave the manor 
without permission. So essentially their whole lives revolved around this one man, around the Norman Lord at the centre of the village living in the manor house, and their lives were dependent on them following that Lord's rules. Again, there's a real sharp hierarchy here. Lord at the top, everyone else down at the bottom. Yes, you've got your free men and, and your villains who represent slightly different classes of peasant, but essentially the relationship is one of power for the Lord and weakness and submission for the peasants at the bottom. So let's do our second knowledge check for today. Number one, what was the name for all of the land owned by the Lord? Number two, how did the manor house compare to peasants' houses? Number three, what is the difference between the free men and the villains? Number four, what percentage of land in the village was kept by the Lord for personal use? So again, just pause the video here, get your pen and paper ready and get some answers down. Okay, so question one, the name for all of the land owned directly by the Lord, that is the domain. Question two, the manor houses compared to the peasants' houses in the sense that they were warmer and much more secure because they were made of stone instead of thatch. Question three, the difference between the free men and the villains is the free men only had to work for the Lord during sowing and harvest times and the rest of the time they could farm for themselves. And question four, how much of the land in the village was kept back for purely personal use by the local Lord? That tended to be about 25 to 35 percent. OK, coming towards the end of this lesson, then there are just a couple more social roles we need to consider, and that is the role of the reeve and the role of the bailiff. So you can probably get an idea just from this picture here what the role of the reeve was. We did mention it in the keywords, but to see if you can guess it from that picture, I'll just give you a moment here. Have a little look. So the reeve is our guy on the left here standing up. And I think we can get a sense of what his role was just from that picture. So let's remind ourselves, the reeve was a peasant chosen by the Lord to manage all the other peasants day to day and make sure that they kept doing their jobs. Uh, it was his role to keep people in line effectively. They would also work on behalf of the crown as a magistrate, so as a minor judge sometimes. And that is where we get our modern word sheriff, which comes from shire and reeve put together. A shire, if you remember, is a large area of land in Norman England at this time. And reeve is this guy, this manager for the local lord that keeps the peasants in line. Finally, we've got the bailiff. And the bailiffs, we still use that word exactly uh, as it is there today. They are in charge of collecting taxes for the crown, ensuring that crops were gathered and that debts were repaid. They were basically a local law enforcer. And that's pretty much the same today. Uh, although they're not the police, they don't enforce the law in um, modern Britain. They do continue to collect debts. That is the central function of the bailiff today. And that is where we get our word bailiff. So final challenge for the lesson. Can you explain in a paragraph the social roles of the Norman village and the different social statuses that these people had? So you're going to describe the hierarchy in the Norman village using all the different roles that we've looked at today. Here are some suggestions for keywords that you could use. Manor, manor house, domain, free men, peasants. Oh, we've got two A's in there. Lord, reeve and bailiff. I would give yourself about 10 minutes on this final challenge. And then if you need to replay the video to check any of your facts, you can check your answer that way. So just to recap for where we've been in today's lesson, we've looked at what were the basic features of the Norman village. 90% of the population lived in villages in the countryside. They are arranged into strip farms with common land for the animals to graze on and a manor house where the lord of the village lived. And in terms of who had power in the Norman village, we've answered that decisively. It's the Lord. The Lord in the manor house has got all of the power there. Yes, there is some power for the free men compared to the villains. And there is some power for the reeves and bailiffs. But the Lord is key. That man at the centre of the village is holding all the power in those villages. Well done for listening today, guys, and good luck with the rest of your course.